Welcome to Biology My Passion. I am Saumya Harikrishna. Today we are going to learn about interspecific interactions or species interactions. The first type we learned predation in the previous video. Today we are going to learn about competition. So you know competition is a type of interaction where both the species involved are getting negative. That means detrimental to both of them. So, when we talked about evolution, Darwin proposed his theories of evolution which stated actually uh, different proposals like a hypothesis, uh, the first one overproduction. Overproduction will lead to struggle for existence, struggle for existence will lead to survival of the fittest. The survival of the fittest means the competition. In a competition though it is detrimental to both of them, one of the species uh, benefits or wins the competition and as a result uh, they will dominate. So, competition is necessary in this nature for evolution to happen. But whenever we talk about competition, what do we think about it? We feel that when two closely related species only can have competition. So, that is one condition that comes to our mind. The species competing should be closely related, not the same. See, in that aspect, we can have two types of competition, intraspecific and interspecific. Intraspecific means within the species competition is there. Inter means between two different species. Here in this chapter we are dealing with an interspecific between two species. But even then we think okay it cannot be with the two unrelated species. Maybe closely related species are competing. And the second condition that comes to our mind is uh, resources are limited. Because uh, whenever resources are plenty there is no competition needed right. Because everyone gets enough resources. But both these related to competition need not be correct. The second case, closely related species compete. But we have some examples. In South American shallow lakes, there are zooplanktons. Like any water body, there are also zooplanktons are there. What are zooplanktons? The microscopic animals in the water. So, for fishes in the water body, zooplanktons are the food. So, they eat the zooplankton. But there are flamingos visiting that lake. So these flamingos also prefer eating the zooplankton. So there occurs a competition between the flamingos and the uh, indigenous fishes in that water. So are there related species Pisces and Aes? Not at all. But they are competing for the same resource. So the competition need not be for the uh, between two closely related species. Second is uh, resources also need not be limited in all the cases. For example, in interference competition, there is a competition called interference competition where one species will completely interfere the foraging pattern or reproduction and all the activities of the other species aggressively. Why? Because that is a superior species, the other one is little inferior species. So even if the uh, resources are not limited, this can happen. So this was actually explained by a scientist called a Gauss. Gauss's competitive exclusion principle that is the name of his theory. Gauss did some uh, experiments or in the restricted or uh, closed space and he got the results that uh, or he came to the conclusion that two closely related species when compete for the same resource eventually one will eliminate in the presence of the competitively superior species. That means one is a smarter species, the other one is little uh, submissive. Then definitely the other one will outgrow this. You know that. So a typical example in front of us is in Galapagos Islands, there is Abingdon tortoise. You know, we have been hearing the uh, story of tortoise and hare since our childhood that how the hare is so smart to reach or uh, the final finishing line or due to overconfidence it lost. But still, tortoise is a very sluggish animal. They were living in the Galapagos Island and these tortoise are very slow in grazing. Whereas goat is highly efficient in browsing or grazing the grass. So what happened since they are very fast or because of their high efficiency, they ate all the grass though it was not limited. But the abundant tortoise over a decade of time, they got eliminated from that particular scenario. Here shows the superiority of the uh, goat over the other species. 
So this is a competition between two species and one is eliminating the other because of its superior nature. This was Gauss's competitive exclusion principle. Now another uh, theory we are studying is competitive release. Competitive release also somewhat similar to this that is if there is a competitively superior species and if there is a competitively inferior species. In the presence of the superior species, the inferior species is confined to a particular region and they are not able to spread widely or uh, flourish well because of the uh, competitively superior species. I will give, give you a small example about this. When you are in the classroom, okay, situation number one, your teacher is not in the class and in the totally in that floor no teacher is to be seen or nobody is there, only you students are there. What will be the condition of the class? Now, scenario two, teacher or rather a very strict teacher is in the class and principal is just outside in the outside the classroom on the corridors. What will be the situation of the class? So here we can say the teacher or principal as competitively superior species. In the presence of the competitively superior species, you, the competitively inferior species, are confined to a narrow geographical area that is within the four walls of the classroom. But if they are removed from that scenario completely and you are sure that they are not there, you will go out of the class and you will scatter, right? This is called a, what the competitive release. Colonel, one scientist, he did some field experiments regarding this. In the rocky sea coast of Scotland, there are barnacles. Barnacles means they are small shelled organisms, they get attached to the rocky surface or we can see them on the surface of the whales also. We will learn about it. Okay, so uh, there are two types of barnacles are there. One type is the larger one, they are called a balanus and the smaller one is called a catamalus. So in the presence of balanus, catamalus was confined to a smaller geographical area. As an experiment, they removed all the balanus from there. Then they found that the catamalus were distributed or widely distributed after that. So this shows competitive release. Okay, now we are coming back to Gauss's competitive exclusion principle where in the presence of a competitively superior species, the other one will be eliminated eventually. It can be there in certain situations like Abington tortoise we saw. But we cannot generalize this rule. Because it's not happening every time in the nature. It can happen, but it is not a generalized rule in nature. Because over a period of time, all organisms tend to evolve to overcome this competition. In that regard, we think about another possibility that is called a resource partitioning. That is, instead of competing with each other, why don't we go for sharing? Right? Suppose in your house also, if your parent is bringing only one packet of chips or one chocolate and you have one more sibling, you both will fight for it. But how can we settle the fight? By dividing it equally for both of you. Right? The same thing. Here also, competition is detrimental to both of them. If you both fight, you know that one of you will win. But what is the problem? The other one will be crying or that uh, sibling will fight with you or beat you or something. But you may eat it, but after eating you will feel regret, right? See, it's detrimental for both the species. But rather, uh, this is actually a big question for all of us. How can it be detrimental for both species because one is winning? But here in nature, we tell it in the context that what if the other species was not there? This species would have achieved more. But it is spending its energy and effort in competing with the species to survive. So its actual potential is being wasted there. So what it could become without the other species is not happening there. That's why it is called a detrimental to both. Understood? Now, so here resource partitioning means what? Instead of fighting for each other or competing, we, they are sharing the resources. So instead of competing for a particular resource by adjusting the foraging pattern. Foraging pattern means what feeding pattern and the, or the food in which they are feeding upon. All these can be adjusted among species to avoid competition. Mac other one scientists have given a typical example for this that is warblers. They are small birds living on trees. There are uh, five types of warblers, five species of warblers living on a single tree. 
but still they are not having any competition but they are living harmoniously there how they are arranging or adjusting their foraging pattern for example one may be uh, going to search in search of food in the morning the other one may be at a night like that they adjust or one will feed on the worms coming to on, on the tree or one may feed on the uh, seeds another one on the fruits uh, like that they can adjust among themselves to avoid competition okay so this is all about competition so these theories are very important when we talk about competition the next is interspecific interaction is parasitism we are all familiar with parasitism or parasites we are heard of so the parasitism means the organism or the species getting free food and accommodation from another species that is called a host species so mosquitoes are not considered parasites because they come suck the blood and go they are not living on our body so the parasites they live on our body and then take the nutrients they are getting the food they harm us but they don't kill us okay because you know if they kill us their life also would be in danger so most of the parasites are host specific that means they can live on only certain particular host they cannot live on the uh, on any random host for example we know uh, the malarial parasite that is plasmodium they live in our liver cell and rbc they are living on human body and another host they have that is mosquito okay so they are very specific they cannot live on any other organism then when they are living on the other organisms they have certain adaptations because most of the time during evolution the host will be trying its best to get rid of this parasite so host will undergo certain changes to eliminate them at the same time the parasites co-evolve means evolve along with them whatever changes the host is bringing parasite will undergo a change to overcome that and still stay to its body okay so that's called a co-evolution so most of the parasites have got these adaptations like loss of unnecessary sense organs you imagine you are like a parasite living on in your house you are not a parasite though you are your parents are providing you free food and accommodation but they don't consider you but imagine you are going to one of your uh, family friends they are offering you uh, you are that you can stay there and study because you are away from your home and they are giving you food and they are not ready to take money they are telling okay you can live here as your own house like that but once you stay there we have to follow certain ethics or social norms we should not go and interfere in their family matters suppose they are discussing something we should not go and tell uh, our opinions and suggestions and interfere and force them to do this that and all um, until and unless we are asked to do so right so in such case we have to close our eyes towards certain things we have to uh, disc, uh, just uh, ignore certain things that we did not hear like that so by unnecessary sense organs they don't want any sense organs as long as they are living inside the body very safely second presence of adhesive organs they need the um, sucker or organs like that to cling on to the host very uh, closely or very tightly so that they don't get uh, eliminated or they don't fall off then loss of digestive system Food, they are absorbing only nutrients they don't even have to digest then why should they spend on uh, energy on maintaining digestive system that's also not there then higher reproductive capacity they reproduce a lot why because they are in a hostile environment because host does not like their stay there so host is trying to eliminate it so in that hostile environment at least some of the individuals or the progeny should survive so the reproduction is so, so high that at least a few will survive at the end okay so these are the adaptations we find in them then the parasites have a very complex life cycle uh, because they have got uh, sometimes uh, more than one uh, host for example human liver fluke they live in the uh, human body it's a nematode that is a uh, round worm but still they need a other host to complete its life cycle like a fish and a snail the same way uh, the malarial parasite it has got another host called a mosquito so the parasites may have a primary host in order to survive in the primary host they need a, a secondary host or a other host as well if the parasite is living on the body what happens to the host the host organisms it affects actually their survival their reproductive ability is lost or reduced or their growth is also reduced their survival is under threat or question 
and another thing is that they become physically so weak that they are more prone to predation predators can easily attack them because they are weak because their nutrients are being taken up or stolen by certain other species living on them now parasites can be classified into two types ectoparasites and endoparasites endo means the inside ecto means the outside so those parasites which live on the outside body of the host organisms are called ectoparasites examples are lice on our head human head we have lice then ticks on dogs or copepods uh, on fish okay uh, the same way endoparasites means they live within the body of the host so usually endoparasites have the complicated um, life and also they have those adaptations which i mentioned earlier and uh, examples are liver fluke and a uh, tapeworm now uh, plants also can be parasites there are total parasites means entirely depending on other organisms or spatial parasites as well so example of a total parasite is cuscuta cuscuta is a parasitic plant because of its parasitic nature it has lost all its leaves and chlorophyll because there is no need of leaf or chlorophyll because it's not preparing food it is taking nutrients from the host plant another interesting type of parasitism is brood parasitism you are all uh, familiar with this but you don't know the name maybe uh, uh, you may all know that cuckoo lays its egg in the nest of the crow right so this is nothing but brood parasitism cuckoo is a lazy bird it doesn't want to make a nest and lay eggs so it will be observing the crow making it nest prior to its breeding season that is spring to summer so once the crow lays its egg this cuckoo goes and lays its egg also with along with the crow's eggs and over a period of evolution the egg has turned its color its texture its size everything similar to that of crow's egg so that the crow is not able to distinguish between its own eggs or it is not realizing that it is some other egg so what happens the crow incubates and finally once it hatches out and starts making the sound only it realizes that the uh, birds or the offsprings are not eggs so this is a typical example of brood parasitism hope you understood all these uh, concepts well and if you have any doubts you can comment me in the comment box if you like my videos please like share and subscribe to my channel biology my passion